This is God's holy word for us, his people. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is God's holy word for us as people. Let's ask him to bless our time in this word. Father, we thank you for your holy scriptures and the truth that they teach us. I ask that you would bless not only this reading of Scripture, but now especially the preaching of your Holy Word. May its truth sound forth and reverberate through our minds and hearts this morning. Write this truth, inscribe it upon our very hearts, that we can take it with us from this place and be conformed more into the image of our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we now pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of my very favorite Christmas songs is the one we just got to hear. Mark Lowry of Gaither vocal band fame. Mark Lowry's Mary Did You Know. Now, it's one of those Christmas songs that captures something, doesn't it? It captures something of the mystery of who Jesus really is and what Christmas and Advent is really all about. You know, we often get caught up in all sorts of things during this time of year that can tend, if we're not careful, to distract us from the most important elements of Christmas. We all face things. Now, this year was a bit strange. It's been a bit of, a, of an odd Christmas season, to say the least. But even still, in the midst of it all, it's still so easy to get caught up in all those Christmas things like... Black Friday, shopping, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, Christmas decorations, wrapping paper, gifts, parties, carols, snow, visiting family, Santa Claus, Christmas movies, and perhaps most important of all, Reese's Christmas trees. There's something about putting a Reese cup in a different shape that makes it twice as good. I don't, maybe it's the extra peanut butter. I don't know. Listen, there's so many things, so many busy voices clamoring for your attention. Now, this is always true, but at Christmas time, it seems especially true. And we all recognize, I hope, that none of those things I just mentioned are bad. But when we allow good things, innocent things, to take our focus off of the most important thing, they begin to lose their innocence. At best, they only interfere 
with our hearts and minds, and at worst, they can become idols. So it's important that we pause at this time of year and we take stock of our own souls and see if our hearts and minds need to be readjusted, realigned in their focus, reoriented towards the one whose birth should be most precious to us at this time of year. A song like Mary Did You Know is an excellent reminder of where our focus and our devotion should be during Advent and Christmas. And in fact, a passage like this teaches us that we should all be like Mary. We should all be like Mary. Mary. Mary sat with the baby Jesus. She held him and kissed him and rocked him to sleep on that holy night. And as she did so, this passage tells us that she contemplated just who this child is and what a miracle it was that he even existed. She thought and pondered about what kind of life he would have. What sort of man will he grow up to be? What is God's purpose and destiny for my little boy? And what part will I get to play in his life? Mary was a mom. And she had all those mom thoughts and questions about her child. You see, Mary's soul was fixated on the holy child, the baby Jesus. The baby in the manger, born of a virgin, son of Mary and son of God. This is the one who must be uppermost in our thoughts and affections as he was for Mary that night when he was born. Mark Lowry's song is a series of questions posed to Mary, asking if she fully grasped, if she really, really grasped who this Jesus was on that first night. Did she realize just who this child really was and all that he would accomplish? And I used to have, I don't know if I still have it, but um, you know, Mark Lowry did all kinds of stand-up. And, and he did a, a, made a video called Mark Lowry on Broadway. And as a setup to, this, to him singing this song with a couple of the guys from the Gaither vocal band, he, he goes through some funny questions. And he's like, I wish I could have I been there with Mary. I could have asked her some questions. And one of the questions he said, I wish I could ask her was, I wonder you know, if she ever had to get on to him for not cleaning his room. Right? I wonder if she ever walked in there to Jesus and said, oh, good Lord, look at this. Were you born in a barn? <laughs> There's all sorts of questions that Mark wanted to ask Mary. Humorous questions, but also the serious kinds of questions that he posed in that song. And that's what it's about, asking who she thought this Jesus was. And in our passage in Luke chapter 2, we read that Mary really did contemplate these types of questions. But it isn't clear from the passage just how much she understood. And that's the inspiration behind the song, this passage in Luke. We see that she thought about these things, but how much did she really know? Now in the passage, she, uh, the, some shepherds are visited by angels... And they're told the good news of the birth of the Messiah. They run to see the child and tell everyone what had happened. Then we read this in verses 18 and 19. Verse 18. And all who heard it, this is the report of the shepherds, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She treasured them up and she pondered. You see, Mary is our best model for how to keep Christmas well. One of my favorite Christmas stories is called The Christmas Story. 
And my favorite version is the one where uh, George C. Scott plays Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, George C. Scott's the one who played Patton in the movie Patton. He's an excellent Scrooge. And it's said about yeah, Scrooge and that, and that story that he knew how to keep Christmas better than anybody else. Of course, that's the end of the story, not at first. He knew how to keep Christmas better than anybody else. And actually, that's not true. Scrooge maybe was number two. In this passage, Mary shows us how to keep Christmas well. And we should all be like her and treasure up and ponder the message of the angels to these shepherds. The angels declare that the message they have come to proclaim is the gospel. You see that back in verse 10. They say, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And that word good news, of course, is the word for gospel. That's what gospel means. It means good news. It's a gospel of great joy that's meant for everyone. You see, the goal of the gospel, Christian, is joy. The goal of the gospel is joy. And the result of that joy is the praise that we see in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. Or the description of these shepherds in verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They praised and glorified God. And that's the overflow of the joy the gospel brings. The gospel's about creating in your heart the joy that overflows in worship. The gospel brings praise and glory from His people, from God's people to His name. This is the gospel of great joy. And at its heart is that Beautiful verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The gospel of the birth of the Savior. Now this morning, what I want us to do in the rest of our time together, is I want us to ponder these things together like Mary. And I want us to treasure them up in our hearts, and to feel their joy and the peace that they can bring. And what we're going to do is look at three different types of sonship. The triple sonship of Jesus that we gain, that we see and glean from this passage. He is son of God. He is son of Mary and son of man. So first, son of God. We talked a little bit about this last week. Son of God. Now I want us to, like I said in the introduction, press in a little further into this Holy of Holies of Christmas. When we think about Jesus and we ponder who He is, we must always remember that Jesus is the Son of God. And what that means is this. Jesus is one single person, an eternal, divine person, one among the Holy Trinity, of one substance with the Father. He is a person who is fully God. Jesus is not the human person who was born in the manger merely. The Son is eternal with the Father. And He has always existed as a fully divine person. And so the one born in Bethlehem is a divine person. One among the Holy Trinity. That's what Son of God tells us. One of the Holy Trinity was in Mary's womb. One of the Holy Trinity who upholds the universe by the word of His power, was doing that work at the very moment He was developing in a young Jewish girl's womb. He was doing both at the same time. And this is why Mary has been called in church history 
the mother of God. Now, before you get a little nervous and think, hold on a minute, you're talking a lot about Mary and you just called her mother of God. Whoa, are we in a Catholic church? <laughs> Relax. Mother of God is a name that's given to Mary, but it's not about Mary. It's about Jesus. Because all that title means, and you don't have to use it if you don't want to, but here's what it means if you do. It means that Mary gave birth to a person, and that person was the eternal Son of God in human flesh. That's all it means. doesn't mean that she gave birth to the divine being or she gave birth to the Trinity or anything like that. It just means that the human being that was born was a person. And before that he was born, he always existed as the second person of the Trinity. A divine person. A divine person was born that day. The Bible in John 1.18 calls Jesus in the New American Standard Version, the only begotten God. The only begotten God. Or as we would say, God the Son. God the Son was born in Mary's womb in human flesh. Jesus is identical with God the Son. They're just two names for the exact same person. Remember John 1.1 1, 1 calls the Son the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, when you think about the baby in the manger, the first thing that should leap to your mind are the words of the Apostle Thomas in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. This is why those shepherds we looked at, not shepherds, the magi we looked at last week, this is why when they get to Jesus and they see him there with his mother, they bow and they worship him. If he was just a human being like you and me, that would have been sinful and idolatrous. You don't worship human beings. You don't worship angels. You don't worship the heavenly hosts. You worship God alone. And these wise men worshiped Jesus. And no one said, don't you do that. Stop. Just worship God. They accepted. Jesus accepted that worship. The little infant in the manger is God in the flesh. As Mark Lowry says, he's God on foot. The eternal Son of God in absolute undiminished deity is sleeping in Mary's arms. As the baby Jesus was sustained in his mother's womb, at the exact same time he was seated upon the throne of eternal glory in highest heaven. Sovereign King of all creation, upholding the universe by the word of His power. This is the supreme mystery of Christmas. The incarnation of God the Son. The coming of God the Son in human flesh. The incarnation. And so you and I must never think that God the Son set aside His deity or any of his divine attributes when he became flesh. It's not like he was God forever and ever and ever, and then it's like, okay, it's time to go be born. Okay, and then he like takes off all of his deity and then leaves it behind and then becomes human and isn't God anymore. That's not how it happened. The Son, without ceasing to be the eternal, fully divine Almighty Son of God clothed Himself in flesh. And He did not get rid of His deity. He veiled His divinity in human nature without in any way ceasing to be the true and living God. The Son laid aside His glory 
but not his deity. Jesus said in John 14, 7, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is an eternal, fully divine person, one among the Holy Trinity. That's who we're talking about. He's the Son of God. And we must never, ever lose sight of the divinity of the boy in the manger. Son of God. Number two, Son of Mary. Son of Mary. If the first thing you should think of when you think of Jesus and Christmas is this is the Son of God, eternal in the heavens, who came in human flesh, the second thing you should think, second thing that should come to your mind and ponder who He is in Christmas is His full and complete humanity. Again, just like it's wrong to say, well, Jesus had His deity, Jesus was fully God, and then He took it all away, set it aside, and then came and became a human being and wasn't God anymore. It's equally wrong to say, well, because He is fully God, then there's no way He could really be a human being like the rest of us. Don't diminish His deity, but also do not diminish His humanity either. Jesus is only one person, a divine person, but this one divine person has two complete natures as a result of the Incarnation. I told you, we're pushing way in. <laughs> We're going way into the deep mystery of Christmas this morning. Jesus is one person, and without ceasing to have His complete divine nature, He adds to His person a complete human nature as well, so that He's one single same person with two complete natures at the same time. And He has those natures without confusion between them. Am I God or man? Oh, he has them without mixing them together. He holds them both together in His single personhood. That's the incarnation. And we say it like this, God, Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He's fully God and fully man. One person who is fully God and fully man. He is as truly and totally human as each one of us. In the fullest, most complete sense of the word, he was a human being. He had a human body, a human soul, a human mind, a will, emotions, human limitations, human frailty. He could be crucified. He could get tired. He could get hungry. He could weep. He could ask questions. He could walk around on the ground. His feet were dusty with the dirt of first century Israel. He was God on foot. He is exactly like us in every respect except He never sinned. He was utterly sinless. Jesus is one eternal divine person, fully God and fully man, and He lives and He acts and operates according to both of those natures at exactly the same time without any division or separation or confusion between them. The divine nature does what it's supposed to do, and the human nature does what it's supposed to do, and they're in complete harmony. Because one person is acting in both natures at the exact same time. That's why we can say, even as Jesus is being held in the arms of his mother, he is Lord of all creation at the exact same time. So let me put it like this. Jesus is God and man, but one Christ. He has no mother of his divinity and no father of his humanity. 
He is Son of Mary, and He is Son of God. These are the two things that should leap to your mind. First, this is the Son of God, but also this is the Son of Mary, and this is the mystery of the Incarnation. And now the last point. He's also not just Son of God, not just Son of Mary, He's Son of Man, the Son of Man. And here I want you to go with me as we see how Scripture, how Luke especially, pulls these threads together. How he pulls these threads together. Back in 2 Samuel 7, God makes a promise to King David. And he tells David, one of your descendants will never cease to sit upon your throne. Now, David and Solomon and everyone else after that thought they knew what that meant. And you can't blame them. They thought it meant, okay, David's going to have a son, and then he's going to be king for a while, and then he'll die. And then his son will be king, and he'll be king for a while, and then he'll die. And then his son, and then his son, and his son. And David will never cease to have a son who will be on the throne. And that's what they thought it meant. A never-ending dynasty, son after son. What they never imagined, what they never thought of, and why nobody knew who Jesus was when he first came, while people had such a problem with it, is that he shows up and he says, no, 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 no. It's not that David will just have endless sons. It's that David is going to have one son eventually who will become king and he will always rule because he will never die. David's going to have a son who will always be king because he will never die. So that's the promise in 2 Samuel. And then we get this strange passage in Daniel chapter 7 about the Son of Man. In Daniel 7, we read this vision that Daniel has. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man. So here we have these two threads. David's going to have a descendant who's going to become king and he will rule forever and ever and ever because he'll never die. He will be an eternal king, an everlasting king. But he has to be born from David's lineage. Okay, now Daniel 7 comes along and says, well, the, this everlasting king who will rule all nations forever and ever and ever and his kingdom will never pass away, this is the son of man. He's going to come from heaven. A man from heaven's going to come down and be given the kingdom, and he's going to rule forever and ever and ever. Okay, well, now we have these two threads. A descendant of David, born in the flesh, and a son of man who comes down from heaven. And the Old Testament, you see, they're like, which is it? Which is it? Who are we looking for here? Like a son of David and an angel, maybe? Or, or what? What's going on here? They're still trying to piece it together. And then into this comes Jesus. Now, there was a prophet, Isaiah, who gave, who gave them the clue about what it all meant. How do you pull these two threads together? And the clue is hidden away in Isaiah chapter 9. We read this together as part of our call to worship. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Notice this poetry here. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Okay. 
He's pulling two threads. Son of David, a child is born. Son of man from heaven, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. This is a child who is born. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David. And over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh, Jehovah God, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Ah, so the child who is born, son of David, who will rule all nations, is also the son who is given because this son of David will be called the mighty God and the prince of peace. And in Luke chapter 2, he pulls these, well, excuse me, in Luke chapter 1, he pulls all these things together in the Annunciation to Mary. He says in Luke chapter 1, to Mary who says, How will this be since I am a virgin? Luke 1.35 the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And he goes on to talk about John the Baptist. Now earlier, before that verse, before he says he will be the Son of God. He tells Mary, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the mystery of the Incarnation that fulfills all these promises, that pulls all these disconnected threads from the prophets and the Psalms and the law and weaves them together in the manger in this beautiful tapestry that reveals God's purposes for the ages. That baby who is born is in the line of David. And he will bear his people's sin upon the cross, but he has been raised from the dead never to die again. And he rules and reigns upon an eternal throne of unspeakable glory today as the head of his church and the captain of his people. He is that king who was to come, the son of David. But he's also the man from heaven, the son of man who comes from heaven in human flesh through the Virgin Mary fully God and fully man this is the fulfillment that no one expected this was also the gift nobody wanted because they crucified him but this is the best gift God could give and if you're his today it's yours and faith this morning isn't just having a belief in your head. It's having a bowed, bended knee in allegiance before this king. This is why your tithes and your offerings aren't just a gift to your church. They're tribute to your king. The wealth of the nations coming into the kingdom in the service of the great king. The one who is born king, son of David, but also the man from heaven who is the almighty son of God. As we ponder these things, this Advent and this Christmas, oh, that we would be like Mary and treasure.
treasure them up in our hearts. Oh, let us treasure them up in our hearts and seek to keep this gospel with us always. To feel the great joy that it brings. To know the surpassing peace it creates in our hearts, in our relationships, in our families, in our friendships, in our marriages, in our world. The Prince of Peace Oh, that he would reign in your heart today. That he would be enthroned in your home and at work. And the way you make decisions and live your life. That he would be the king of everything and everyone. Because one day he will return and every knee will bow. Let's start now. Let's start now. And welcome this King this Christmas for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us this deep mystery, the incarnation, that you sent your Son who is fully divine, fully God, equal with you in every respect, and that you sent him to take upon himself our weak lowly human nature to come in our condition and yet free from sin so that he could be our savior and oh may we recognize in him the son of man sent from heaven but also the eternal king who was promised to come may we see in him the fulfillment of all of our hopes of all the long promises of the old testament may we see in him the fulfillment of all of our longings, that we would bow our knee to him now instead of being made to bow at his return. Oh, may we be found treasuring up the glory of Christmas, not just in this season, but may we adore you all year round. May we treasure you in our hearts, Lord Jesus. I pray you would take the throne of our hearts and lives even now and that we would be your faithful, joyful, obedient, zealous people, eager to be about the king's business, to spread the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom, to see your church built and others come to bow the knee to worship with us. Oh, make us passionate servants of this kingdom, and may we be true, faithful, loving, obedient disciples of this king. Do this for us, we pray, Lord. Win our hearts and our affections. May we never forget who you are. Though the world sees and soon forgets, may we never forget. We live for you, King Jesus. Rule in our hearts, in our homes, in our church today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.